Eternally Yours, a program of inspiring music and an eternal message of hope. On this program, Arnie Bryan shares his testimony. Our musical guest is Josie Lambert. And Reverend Mabley's sermon is titled, The Lawyer's Scene. Now let's join Reverend Mabley and her guest, Arnie Bryan. Welcome once again to Eternal Yours, Testimony Time. Well, today we're going to hear from a senior saint. And so I'm welcoming today Reverend Arnie Bryant, founder with his wife, Kathy, of uh, Prayer Canada Ministry. Welcome, Arnie. Thank you. So good I to have really you I really appreciate the opportunity to let the world know there's a God in charge. Amen. <laughs> you know him right well. Uh, let's hear your testimony. How did God get hold of your heart as a young, heart as a young man, and where do you all come from? Well, it was... My beginning on that was very simple. My mother told me I accepted Jesus when I was three years old. I don't remember that, but I was brought up in a Christian family where we prayed and read the Bible every morning, every morning. And then we had kind of Sunday church on, at our dinner table on Sunday afternoon because we lived five and a half miles from town, and we didn't have a car. It was by horses, and so we didn't always go to church, just once in a while. But uh, we kids had to learn a verse every Sunday afternoon after dinner before we left the, the dining table. And uh, so that kind of put us in good stead for grasping what the scriptures mm -hmm. had to say. Mm -hmm. And uh, my dad was always very good about explaining things because he and mom got saved in the old hellfire and brimstone of the Methodist church mm -hmm. that knew what was the difference between heaven and hell. I'm sure you could tell the, the folks a big difference. <laughs> <laughs> so. And, uh, you know, uh, th through the Depression, I was... Uh, I'm well aware of the of the famous depression of the 30s. In 1939, I was 21 years old, right, and I was on the first call up with the army when the war broke out. But uh, uh, we did a 30-day uh, training up in Red Deer. But they didn't want me because I was a farmer and a rancher, and they wanted us to keep raising food for the Army. Mm -hmm. So I didn't join up at that time, but I was called up to, for a 30-day. And uh, so then we went back to the farm. And it was just uh, interesting how one of the interesting things that I always remember, we were taking a, a load of wheat to town uh, in the middle of the winter, with a, on the sleighs, about 60 bushel uh, wagon load of, a sleigh load of Wheaton, uh, that we had a nice sorrel team. And my dad said, you know, and, uh, I was just 14 at the time. And uh, he said, son, if you don't smoke, I'll give you this team until you're 21. Well, you know, I kind of turned it, because at school, you know, we were always dropping grass and anything you could smoke. We were always, you know, doing this at school. But uh, so I said, after a while, I straightened up and I said, it's a deal. So I never smoked or drank ever since then. And uh, I thought it Even was... Even since then? Huh? You just carried on not smoking and drinking? Never. Praise the Lord. Yeah. You're a real saint, you and your precious wife. Well, uh, my, I got the sorrel team. I, I got the sorrel team. My dad didn't take them back. He, I, I got them, and uh, they were a beautiful team of horses. And, of course, uh, our key business was raising horses. Yeah, every winter we were breaking horses all winter. And my dad used to ship them east, 21, 22 horses to a boxcar load, and ship them down to the stockyards in Hamilton, Ontario, and he'd auction them off to the farmers, matched teams. They all wanted matched teams. And so my dad knew all the horses within 50 miles of our place. Well, you must have had quite a successful farming business to have that many horses. Oh, well, Your we, parents we, were not poor. At, ti at times we had 40, 50 horses. Wow. Yeah, we had a big barn. and 
You see, God was blessing your Christian heritage. God was blessing your parents. Yeah. And he blessed your life too. So you said you, you received Christ at three, your mama said. But when do you remember God getting a hold of your heart? Well, uh, I, I remember uh, it was, you know, time after time. But I remember uh, I went up before the church in the Baptist church in Coquitlam when we were there. And, uh, you know, I made this uh, solid commitment. And then I was baptized in water and mm -hmm. so on. And uh, but then I've made many, uh, I've made many uh, commitments since then, mm -hmm. as the days go by, and so it was wonderful how God just moved to uh, challenge me. And then when I joined the Navy, it was interesting that um, I learned how to cut hair from my dad, and of course for. You didn't have to be much of a hair cutter uh, for the Navy because you just mowed it off. <laughs> and uh, so it took me about five minutes and, uh, to, to cut people's hair. But I had a captive audience. Uh -huh, and I talked talk to them about Jesus. the Lord uh, while I was cutting their hair. Good for you. And led many to the Lord. Praise God. And uh, then uh, an another interesting thing was... Um, uh, when I got into the insurance business, the Lord gave me the name, Faith Insurance Agencies. Hmm. I was bringing up some material for a lady the other day and still have a faith calendar, faith insurance. And, of course, people would say, oh, Ernie, that's an unusual name. Of course, that's what I wanted them to ask me. That's right. Because I spent, you know, the first half hour telling them about faith, and then it usually took me five minutes to sign them up for insurance. <laughs> Hallelujah. I want to thank you for being on the telecast and being a faithful, mighty, anointed man of God. You inspire all of us, you and your wife. In the name of Jesus, thank you. It's my desire to live for Jesus. It's my desire to live just like Him. Though oft I failed, brought Him much shame. It's my desire It's my desire to help someone today, someone who may have failed to see the way I too was once so lost but I found my way to God it's my desire to live for Him if you could see Jesus brought me from to where I am today, then you would know the reason why I love my Jesus so. If you could see, and many don't know where I came from, where Jesus has brought me from to where I am today, 
married 50 years, big time on the 28th of April. Pretty good, eh? Now you know the reason why I love my Jesus so. You can take this world, all its wealth and its riches. I don't need Earth's powers. It's my desire. It's my desire. It's my yours to to live just like him thank you Josie Lambert for once again giving us an anointed song for the telecast Josie is a dear friend of mine we go way back many decades and uh, when I hear her sing sometimes I move to tears and you know what? We can get, send you a DVD of Josie Lambert's music for a gift to the ministry of $15, and I hope you order them. It'd be so anointed, it could fill your home and your life with God's presence. And now, Heart in Christ, Heart in Christ a message I've entitled, titled, The Lawyer's Scene. A Lawyer's Scene. So bear with me for a little while as we kind of dream a bit. Picture a criminal. He's in... He's in the courtroom, and he's in the stand where the prosecutor will accuse him. And he has a lawyer, and there's a judge. But listen to this with your precious thoughts and heart. Listen with your soul. What if the one that was being charged was you or me? And if you picture yourself in that courtroom, and there's a legitimate charge, and then you look and see that your lawyer is Jesus Christ going to bat for you. And then you look at the judge and he's smiling because the judge is your father. I don't think you'd be too worried in that courtroom. <laughs> now, how do I relate that to something in the Bible? Well, Satan is the accuser of the brethren. He can accuse us because he's got a legal right to accuse us because Adam and Eve, our forefathers, they sinned and we all inherited a sin nature. And you may think, are you telling me that a little newborn baby inherited a sin nature? Yes. Now I know all babies go to heaven. All children go to heaven. But I believe, according to God's word, when you reach the age of accountability, and I think it's 12, then you need to be responsible for your actions. And all have sinned and come short of God's glory. It says that in Habakkuk. So God is holy and he can't look on sin. And God created us to have a love relationship with him. So God had a big dilemma that only he could solve. And he did. Hallelujah. So God sent Jesus Christ in your place or mine and mine to die for our sins. Someone had to die. God had said the wages of sin is death. He told Adam and Eve if they ate of the forbidden fruit that they would die. That's eternal separation from God. It's much bigger than six feet under. And so Jesus Christ is our lawyer. He is the one that loves us. And Father God is a judge who loves us too. And greater is Christ in God's people than the enemy in the world. And so we get, we get accused, but we should know what to do, especially if you know Jesus Christ is Lord, and I hope you do. And if you phone in the counselor, they will help you, introduce you to Jesus Christ as Lord. And uh, then you begin a strong walk with God. And then the Holy Father, who's a judge, he is your father. You see, you have to be born of God. You have to be born of God to be a child of God, just like you had to be born in the natural to be a child of that family. And so I want to also portray another scenery, and then I'm going to read a few scriptures to kind of validate a bit what I'm saying. Another scenario is this. Say you're in prison. You're in prison for whatever you've done wrong, whether it's uh, lying, losing your temper, anything. But they imprisoned you, and you're in there, and you are sentenced to death. The wages of sin is death, eternal separation from Holy Father. And along comes a king in a beautiful robe, 
beautiful royal garment with a crown on his head. And he says to the jailer, open that prison. I am going to die in their place. Let that one go free. And that's just what Jesus Christ did. For God so loved the world, and you're part of it, that he gave. Love gives and gives. He gave his only son, Jesus Christ. If you believe in him and you have enough faith to believe in him, I know you do, and you ask Jesus Christ, come in your heart, be your Lord, be your Savior, forgive me your sins. You say, forgive me my sins, and he will. He'll wash you whiter than snow. And the Holy Spirit will come inside you and be with you forever like he's with me. And then you speak with your mouth and mean it. Jesus Christ, you're my Lord, and the angels in heaven will rejoice, and you'll be born of God. Hear God's word on the stories I've been saying. Romans chapter 8, beginning at verse 31. It's speaking, that it's entitled, in my Spirit-Filled Life Bible, it's entitled, God's Everlasting Love. I highly recommend this Bible, edited by Jack Hayford and others. Really good New, New King James Bible with lots of notes and kingdom dynamics. And God's Word says, What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? So Father God Almighty, the judge, is for us. He's for you and he's for me. He who did not spare his own son, Jesus Christ, but delivered him up for us all. Father God loves you so much, he delivered up his own son to die in your place and mine. How shall he not with Jesus Christ freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? And that's what got me into the courtroom scene. Who can lay a charge to me, God's elect, and you if you know Jesus Christ is Lord? Who can lay a charge? For it is God who justifies Hallelujah. You know what justified means? Just as if you'd never sinned. It is God who justifies us through Jesus Christ, what he did on the cross. Verse 34, who is he who condemns? The enemy of our soul, of course. Who is he that condemns? It is Jesus Christ who died and furthermore is risen. Who is even at the right hand of the Father, God, and he makes intercession for us. So not only did he die to save us, but he's praying for us Christians. He's praying for me right now. Thank you, Jesus. You're praying for me, my God. And if you read further along Romans 8, it even says the Holy Spirit helps your weaknesses and intercedes with groanings which cannot be uttered. And the next verse is quite wonderful, too. Well, God's word is wonderful. Verse 35, who shall separate us from the love of God? Hear this with your heart, dear one, whom God loves so dearly. Who shall separate us from the love of God? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword, as it is written? For your sake, God's sake, we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. slaughter. But listen, this is what God says about us and his love. Yet in all things we are more than conquerors through him who loves us. And we, this, man, this man of God, Paul, that wrote this, the scripture says, I am persuaded, neither death nor life nor angels or principalities, nothing can separate you and I from the love of God. Not powers to come, not powers present, not height, not depth. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. God will continue to love you all your days, precious ones. Even if you don't know Jesus Christ, and even if you choose not to receive Jesus Christ, but I hope you do, he will still love you because God is a God of love. That is his nature. He doesn't change. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever and ever and ever. So there's no reason for you to be condemned. You know, many people quote John 3.16, but we must not forget John 17 as well. They connect so good. John 3, 16 says, For God so loved the world, you and I, and everyone, that he gave Jesus Christ, whoever believes in him would not perish, but have the life, eternal life, the gift of life eternal. And the next verse says, For Lord Jesus came not to condemn, but to save. Jesus didn't come to condemn you. He knows you've done things wrong. He knows I've done things wrong and still do at times. But he didn't come to condemn. He came to save. And I try to be careful because scripture says, Jesus said, 
My Lord Jesus, you said, he who is without sin casts the first stone. Nobody threw a stone at that woman that was caught in, in wickedness. God loves you. And he doesn't want you or I to live and go through life condemned. No. Condemnation is heavy. Do you know that most people are in hospitals, especially psychi psychi psychiatric wards, and they are there mostly because they feel guilty about things they've done. Guilt is heavy. It's a burden. And sin, too. God wants all that put on to Christ. Jesus Christ came that we would have life, have it more abundantly, and our joy would be full. As it is written, 1 Peter 2.24, Jesus Christ bore our sins, sicknesses, pains, griefs, sorrows. And by his stripes, we are healed. You know, when you have a big sorrowful thing happen in life, you claim that promise. You know, when you lose someone you love, and I know what that's like, I lost a son. A good 15, 20 years, over 15 years ago. And I know I claim that promise, God. And he protected me from over much sorrow. Because Jesus bore our sins, sicknesses, pains, griefs, and sorrows. By his stripes we are healed. That's God's word. God loves you so much. And he wants you to realize that he wants to be real in your life. Every moment he wants you and him to have a relationship. Doesn't mean you talk to him all day. Mind you, I do a fair amount of that. But when you get in trouble, just ask God to help you. Even throughout the day, shoot up arrow prayers. If you look in Nehemiah chapter 1, that's what he did. The king noticed that his face was sad. And the king had never seen his cupbearer. You know what a cupbearer is? That's the one that tastes the wine and makes sure it's not poison for the king to have it and the food as well. The king trusted Nehemiah. And he went to the king and his countenance was sad. And if you displease the king, even with a sad countenance, it could have been those days off with your head. And so the king said to him, Nehemiah, why is your countenance down? Basically, that's what he said. And Nehemiah immediately, the Bible says, he shot up an arrow prayer. And I'm sure he said, God, give me favor with this king. And not only did he get favor with that king, but Nehemiah uh, got so much supplies and letters of recommendation. And he stirred up the Jewish people and they rebuilt the walls. And you know what? The Lord Jesus Christ wants to rebuild the walls of our lives that are broken down by life's troubles and by the enemy of our soul. He's the real accuser. And he has supernatural power to make you feel bad. So don't go around carrying the weight of guilt. If you phone the counselor, I'm sure that they will help you to get rid of that. Just let it go. <laughs> like a heavy backpack that's weighing you down with rocks in it. And you just cast it off. And then you get free in Jesus Christ. Happened to me about 35 years ago. And I've never been the same. And I'm so glad he called me to speak of his love and his word. So again, I say, as I've said in the past, I'm God's mouthpiece to you. God loves you with an everlasting love. Nothing can separate you from God's love, even if you're not a Christian. But how wonderful it would be if you respond to that love. I responded to God. I began my walk with him through one key truth. I discovered God loved me. And in my heart, when I heard those words in a united church in Camel River, B.C., in my heart I felt something did a flip. And I decided right then, I'm going to love back that God that loves me. And I didn't realize I was fulfilling the word in 1 John, I believe it's verse 19, that says, we love him because he first loved us. Oh, please, precious one, receive that God loves you and choose to love back the God that loves you and have a deep love relationship with the King of kings, Lord of lords, God of very God, Almighty Father, who loves you and is on your side. Eternally Yours Television is entirely supported by interested viewers and listeners like you. In appreciation of your gift of $20 or more, we are pleased to offer a gift. Please prayerfully consider your role in supporting Eternally Yours Television. Beloved ones who God loves so dearly, I'm wondering what you would think if I was to tell you that God Almighty 
can work every single thing that happens to you and I for good. Well, it's true. He says so in Romans 8, 28. God works all things together for good for us who love him and are called. Every person that responds to have Jesus Christ as Lord, you become a called one, and I believe a chosen one. And then from that moment on, God will work all things together for good if you love him and because you're a called one, a Christian. Hallelujah. Now, doesn't mean that everything good will, only good things will happen to us, but he'll work it to good. So you might say, well, I'm going through so much. How can God work that to good? This nasty thing I'm going through in life. Because, dear one, we turn to him in our troubles and our walk with him deepens. And when we have strength to go through one trial, if we reflect back on that, we know we'll have strength to go through the next trial. And life is full of ups and downs. We're kind of like what the word says in Deuteronomy 11. It says that um, they drink of the rain from heaven. I drink of the rain from heaven. And often in my devotions, I'll say that to the Lord. I, I've come this morning to drink of the rain from heaven. Water me every moment so nothing by any means hurts me. And he will water by the Holy Spirit. Be sure you ask God to fill you with the Holy Spirit. It's so very important. But I also wanted to share a few verses here. Romans 8, 29 and 30. For those whom God foreknew, that's the ones who become Christians, he he also predestined us to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. Every Christian is destined to become like Jesus, even if it's in the twinkling of an eye and eternity future. And he says that he might be Lord Jesus, the firstborn among many brethren. In verse 30, moreover, whom he called, he predestined. If you responded to Jesus Christ as Lord, you were predestined to be God's son, God's daughter. Amen. Predestined. Because God knew you were going to come. And these he also called, who, those he also called whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, he also glorified. Hear what my Bible says about that being glorified. It's so perfect. Glorified is used a prophetic perfect, speaking of a future event, as if it was already done. Because it is certain God will do it. Oh, take a sigh of relief, every one of you that have Jesus Christ as Lord, and it's my hope you all do. And if you want to know Jesus, phone in the counselor, she'll help you. And we are destined to be glorified. Praise the living God. It's our destiny. Amen. If this telecast has ministered to you, would you please prayerfully consider becoming a financial partner? that we may continue to reach out for God's glory. It would be wonderful to hear from you.